and welcome to another episode of the Ride On Motorcycle Podcast, sponsored by Break Free. I'm your host, Jogo, and today we're bringing in the OG of motorcycle training content. He's a retired motor officer. You might have bought one of his Ride Like a Pro DVDs, seen him on YouTube, or maybe you've attended one of his uh, Ride Like a Pro classes. That's right, we're bringing in Jerry Motorman Paladino. Can't wait to talk to him. But before we do, a couple quick announcements. First on the list, here in about a week, March 21st through the 23rd, going out to Pensacola, Florida for the Lock and Lean Rodeo. Going to be competing in that. Can't wait for that. My buddy Q from Riding and Wrenching is going to be there with me alongside with Andy Schultz, which is one of the chat moderators. And the owner of Lock and Lean is putting on a special slow speed race just between Q and I. And the winner of that's going to win a Lock and Lean Angry Cone Trophy. So if you guys are in the area and you want to see me beat Q in the slow race, 4 p.m. Pensacola Harley Davidson. And right after that race, Q and I are going to be doing a little meet and greet at the same place, Pensacola Harley Davidson. So come on by, love to meet you, shake your hand, give you some stickers and chat. Now, the next thing on my list is if you're not in my Facebook group, make sure you go to Facebook, type in Jogo Motorcycle Adventures, click join. We'll get you in there. I plan on posting some updates while I'm at that motorcycle rodeo, so you don't want to miss that. And then last on the list, as I mentioned in the intro, this stream is sponsored by Break Free. If you don't know who or what they are, basically it's a company that makes a taillight for the back of your helmet and you just slap it on. You don't have any wires, no Bluetooth, fantastic product. And I'll give you a little more info on that here in a bit. All right. Now that I got all that out of the way, for you, those of you that watch the, the podcast, you know how we do it around here. We got to bring in Jerry with the intro. So let's go ahead and roll it. going on man hey how you doing it's great to be here hey glad to have you uh be, before we start jumping into these questions just want to go here into the live chat just recognize a few people that are here we got lee sturges that's here he's always here about uh five hours early so no he didn't miss anything jimmy the bull miss jenny we got mj sergeant major uh then we also have riding and wrenching our our local heckler for the live stream ss goldwing and of course my wife is in here it's good to see everybody here all right jerry so we're just going to go ahead and jump into the first question that we have uh so for some of the people that don't don't know you which everybody should know you unless you're living under a rock uh go ahead and just tell us a, a little about yourself and your youtube channel well i uh, i started back in uh in 1999 i went to motor school and uh i've been riding since 74 but the only instructions i had back in 74 i bought my first bike and a friend of mine said i even had him ride the bike home uh, and he's uh, he said well i said can you give me any tips he said yeah follow me and that was it that was the only instructions i had <laughs> And, you know, I read a lot of books about motorcycle training and technique, but, and I, I even thought that I was using the techniques, but the first day of motor school, we had, uh, I think it was 20, 25 guys, <coughs> excuse me, there was, they were all troopers. I was the only deputy in the class. And uh, the, the, the instructor is sort of like a, a drill sergeant. In fact, he was a drill sergeant prior to getting into the highway patrol. And, and he yells attention and all the troopers stood at attention. We don't do that as deputies, but I got in there with him, stood at attention. And he, and he held up the keys to a brand new uh, a Harley a Road King. He says, anybody here know how to ride a motorcycle? So I, I talked to a few of the guys, and some of them have never had never been on a bike in their lives. And so I, I figured that's what he meant. So I raised my hand, and he jumps in my face, and he screams. He says, you don't know nothing about riding a motorcycle, but you're going to know if you make it through this course. And he was right. I quickly realized that 
maybe I knew what the techniques were and I would use on them just a tiny little bit. But when I finished that course, I actually knew how to ride and I knew the difference between using the techniques correctly and using them just a little bit is what separates the amateur from the professional. And, and I was so, so superior rider that I could throw away the 20 years I, of riding that I had before. And I said, everybody should know this stuff. And I, I said, I, but I also knew that there's a lot of guys that have, uh, only guys have this an ego thing. They're afraid to take any kind of class because they think everybody else is going to be better than them or they'll look stupid or they'll drop their bike, et cetera. So I said, I have to find a way to reach these people and, and, uh, allow them to train themselves in the proper techniques. And that's when I came out with the Ride Like a Pro video. And I talked about it online and it, the internet was pretty new at the time. And I, I went on a couple of forums and I had a signature picture of me making a U-turn on a Honda VTX 1800 within two parking spaces. So everybody said, is that Photoshopped? And I said, no, I, you know, I just wanted to get some interest in it. And, and everybody said, well, how do you do that? I said, well, if I had a video that showed you step-by-step -step how to handle your bike like a motor officer, would you be would you be interested in buying it and how much how much would you pay for it and i got people saying yeah i'd, I'd love to have the, an instruction a video and anywhere from uh, 20 20 dollars to 50 dollars people are saying so initially sold the first video for 34 dollars, and the first day i had it online i sold 80 of them and i said boy i think i got something here yeah <laughs> and the video quality i had filmed it myself with a friend of mine and it wasn't the best. The, the information on there was very good, but the video quality and the sound, et cetera, wasn't the best. So about a month later, I hired a professional to do the uh, an, another video, and uh, it took off from there. Now, since that time, every three, four years, I, I improve the video. As I go along with my students, I find uh, things that I try things on them and see if, well, if this works, I'll put it in the video. And uh, I, I renew it so that it's it's not dated. And the last one we did was the Ride Like a Pro Experience video, which is uh, we used, I think, five women riders and five guys and all kinds of motorcycles from Harleys to Indians to Gold Wings to even a Triumph in there, just so that people can't say, well, my bike won't do that. So I right. wanted to make sure that everybody knew if it's a bike's got two wheels, one in the front and one in the back, these techniques are going to work and they're going to work very well. And the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, about your YouTube channel. So, uh, for the people that haven't seen it before, what, what kind of stuff do you post on there? Well, I do, uh, mainly tips, tricks, and techniques. And, uh, I started back in, uh, I think it was when YouTube first came out it was 2004 or five, I, I believe. And what happened was I, I was doing a, a two minute spot for a local TV, a biker TV show. And he started posting the videos and they, they started doing pretty well online. And at the time, I didn't know anything about monetization or any of that. Right. So I, of course, started my own YouTube channel. I put up the videos that I did. And I think I've got over 1,600 videos on there. I also do reviews of uh, motorcycle reviews and uh, road tests and any product that I think would be uh, of interest to my viewers. So, yeah, I've been at it now. I, I do generally two videos a week. And uh, it, it's been it's been quite a while. Of course, now I monetize and, and uh, I probably lost a, a million dollars not monetizing for the first <laughs> five or six years. But then I got wise to what was going on. Yeah. So um, that another question that I that I have for you, where, where did you get the nickname Motorman? Obviously, you're a motor police officer. Did somebody give you that or how, how did that come about? <laughs> Well, a motorman is is uh, any law enforcement officer assigned to a motorcycle division is called a motorman. Some states, uh, I think New York, they call you a wheelman, but uh, most I, I know are, are called motorman. And and, and uh, since a lot of people didn't know what that was, I wanted to use that name, motorman, so that people would realize that yeah, if you're if you're a motorman, you actually know how to ride a motorcycle, and uh, people should watch you and and listen to to what you tell them. So. Yeah, I've been using Motorman for since I first started, actually. Okay, very cool. So, moving into question two, you went you went into it a little bit there. Oh no, actually, I'm thinking of question number three. But, <laughs> but how how long have you been riding, and what exactly got you into riding motorcycles? Well, way back in '74, uh, I was going out with a girl, and her father had a, uh, I think it was a Honda Goldwing. And I, I always liked motorcycles, but uh, yeah, I started talking to him and I decided that uh, 
yeah, maybe I'll buy a bike. And I, I bought a, a, a new Honda 404, which is now a classic. I didn't realize that. But I, I bought a brand new in 74. It was $1,200. And I uh, had, had some fun with it. But I didn't know anything. I had no instructions. You didn't need to take a course or anything at that time. This was up in New York. And uh, I, I would have problems. Like I, I would travel some of the best roads up in upstate New York. And I would get into a curve. And, and I would get into tank slappers and things like that. And I, I thought it was the bike. I later found out it was me. The problem was I would get into a turn too fast and, and then snatch the front brake in the middle of the turn, then release the brake, get on and off the gas, do all the things you shouldn't do. And, and it would it would cause uh, serious problems. I never had a crash, but it was just dumb luck that I didn't. And uh, I kept that bike for about a year. And then I got a Honda 750. Uh, and I think new it was 1800. And uh, that was 76, I believe, maybe 75. And I remember riding that bike home. It was, I bought it in February. I lived in the Bronx at the time, and I bought it in upstate New York. It was about an 80-mile ride. And I mean, I froze my ass off riding, <laughs> riding home. I had to stop and put uh, newspapers inside of my ski jacket just to try to try to keep warm. And it and the bike felt like to, to me like I was driving a car as compared to the the 400F. Now, of course, the 750 is nothing. It's uh, you know it feels like a toy as compared to you know the heavyweight uh, tours and cruising motorcycles that I ride now. Right. Yeah. And uh, that that that's funny. That, I think everybody's found their, themselves in that situation where they don't have the right gear and you're young and you're like, ah, it's not that cold outside. I'm just going to roll with it. But you learn very quickly about that. Uh, well, I actually, I learned a little bit, but I then the, the following year, I took a ride from, from New York to, uh, to Key West and it was mm -hmm. end, end of February. And when I left, it was one of those days in New York where it got up to like 60 degrees. So I'm thinking, well, I'm heading South. It's going to keep getting warmer. So <laughs> It, as soon as the sun went down, it didn't. It got colder and colder. And again, I I, I had a, a ski jacket, if you remember those, and and the the brown gloves. At at the time, you could buy they were brown work gloves, and you buy them for thirty five cents. So I had oh. two pairs of those on on each hand, and, and I mean, constantly one hand was on the motor trying to stay warm. By the yeah. time I got to Key West, I I, uh, I wanted to sell the bike because my butt <laughs> hurt so bad from from the seat, which was awful. And my hands were asleep because of the cold, and also the, you got a lot of uh, high frequency vibrations on those those early four cylinder bikes. So it was a miserable ride. But it took me, I think, two and a half days to get there to cover. Uh, it was about sixteen hundred miles, uh, and and then from that point on, I I, I had rode on and off. Sometimes I, I had a motorcycle, sometimes I didn't. But I really got back into riding around um, ninety seven or ninety eight. And uh, shortly thereafter, then, then I, I was able to go to motor school. Okay. Um, so, so you didn't really have any any other influence other than your girlfriend at the time, father? Yeah, that was that was really it. Uh, I mean, oh. back in 67, I went to Italy with my father. And, mm -hmm. and uh, at that time, uh, I don't know if it's still the same way, but if you had a 50cc or less, you didn't need a license. So I was 12 or 13 years old. And... Uh, my father rented a, a 50cc honda vespa i mean a, yeah a vespa and it had a, a three speed and the clutch and the, the three speed was on the the left side and it took me about five minutes to figure out how to use a clutch and, and i was cruising all around italy on it and and uh, that was actually my first experience on a motorized two-wheeled but uh, like i said didn't, the first bike was 74 and then okay. on and off sometimes i had a bike for a while sometimes i didn't but in 97, I really wanted to get back into it. Gotcha, gotcha. We got a comment from Michael Polis, which we're going to open it up for Q&A here at the end after all these questions. He, he just wants to say that, Jerry, I would like to come down to Florida for one of your classes. Well, what's stopping him? Yeah, <laughs> go and do it. <laughs> go He's on there. down. I, I even have... Uh, two bikes that i rent for the class i have an electric glide or, or a sportster so that for for people that are flying in from from out of town i can rent them a bike to take the class and i get a lot of that uh, at, at least uh, once or twice a month somebody's is renting either one or both of the bikes to take the class uh, there's also um, i think it's called ride share that you could just people put online their motorcycle and what yeah. it is and they rent it to you i i, I don't know if the cost is uh, prohibitive or what but 
that's another thing. So if you wanted a specific bike, if you have a an Indian chief and you, that's what you want to ride, you'll find one on, on the, that website to rent here in Florida. Right, right. All right. But if so, you rent it, don't don't tell them you're t- you're coming to yeah, a class. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they might not loan it to you. Right, and make sure you don't drop it. Yeah, that's key. All right, so we're going to move into question three, and as I s- said, you you already answered some of this, but I have a little video that I cut together to go with the question. So I'm going to go ahead and roll this video, and we'll get into the question. All right. During the course of this DVD, I'm going to give you all the basic knowledge you'll need to safely learn to ride your motorcycle under controlled conditions. During the course of this video, I'm going to show you exactly how the parking lot exercises and the techniques in my Ride Like a Pro video actually apply in real world situations. During the course of this video, I'm going to be showing you how to avoid those errors and negotiate your favorite winding road the safest possible way. Hey, Motorman here with a new video titled The Ride Like a Pro Experience. It's probably about an hour and a half into the class. He's starting to lose that fear of leaning the motorcycle. He's starting to realize that it simply turns the handlebars, the bike will lean. If you turn your head and eyes, you'll make it through the turns every time. All right, so what you guys just saw there was some of the evolution of... Uh, jerry's dvds and then into his uh into his course ride like a pro so the question for number three is how did your ride like a pro course come about like so you went from the dvds and then you started your actual own course yeah well once the 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 video got popular people started calling me and saying you know do you do you offer a live class and uh I, i didn't at the time and it took me about um, oh, probably two or three months, and I got a bunch of my friends together, and and I would show them what to do using the the exact order I showed in the video. And I initially started with eight hours, and boy, I found out that after about four to five hours, people get started getting worse because they were so tense and they weren't used to doing these these uh, maneuvers, so they would get tired out and get worse. So I found out that four to five hours is the key. Any more than that, for most people, you start getting overtired and overtrained. And, and uh, the, the pretty much the same way I did the course back, way back in uh, 1999 is the same way I do it now. The same exercises in the order. And I use the order that I learned in motor school because each uh, exercise builds towards the next. So uh, I've seen some other courses that uh, they they do down here, and I think in Tampa and some other places where people can go to the course. But depending on how many people show up, they might start somebody in a figure eight. They might start, you, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to, to the way they do it. But I know from experience and from trial and error that it works best to first start with the slow race, then the slow cone weed, lead, lead that into a U-turn, then the offset cone weed. So the order that I use seems to work the best. And, and I've tried uh, different things over the years and added stuff to it as well. But uh, I pretty much got it down to a science really fast. So in about, uh, I guess, six months after motor school, where I actually started the course and it got so popular, I, I had to start turning people away. I mean, I would get 17 to 20 people in a class. Then I had my wife helping me because I trained her. And uh it, it just worked out really well. And then I started franchising out to, to different states because I didn't want to be traveling, you know, uh, to North Carolina or California, wherever to do a class. So I said the best way to do is get motor, other motor officers who are interested in teaching people, have them come down here so I can make sure that they, because I know that some motor officers took a motor officer training once and they never trained after that. But uh, I wanted to make sure I had the top people and uh, th- make sure that they knew the order and the phraseology that i use because i wanted to keep it the same all over the country and it's worked out pretty well yeah that's great so uh you know about how many locations you have across the country we have uh 20 in the united states and one in japan oh wow really in japan yeah that's that's interesting that's awesome how, how did that work out did that instructor have to come come over to you and yes tr- he was a, he was a motor officer in Japan, and and he came he contacted me and he came here, 
and he brought a translator with him because he spoke very little English. Wow. And, and I didn't know this, but if in Japan, anybody who wants to take the motor officer course in Japan can take it for free. Oh, wow. So I, and I, when he told us, I said, well, how do you expect to make any money if they're doing that? He said, well, the people that he's looking for are people that have Harley Davidson's over there because that's a, they're like twice as much money as they are here. So it's a prestige thing and they don't want to, uh, take their, their Harley to the regular class and be there with a bunch of people with, you know, a little 500 CC bike or right. 300 CC bike. So, and he was right. It, it, it has worked out very well. He's been in business now. It's got, it's got to be 10 years. And, uh, he, he holds a class every week, weather permitting, it gets it's, uh, some parts of Japan. It does get pretty cold in the winter time, but he does a real good job. And, uh, he, he's got videos too up on, on YouTube. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. That that kind of came out of left field when you said Japan. I said, wait, wait a second, Japan? <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, and their their style, the police boat officer style, there is a little bit different, but they're using much smaller motorcycles. Mm -hmm. So so I I had it. I you know I showed him the way that we do it here. I said, so if you want to train people in the ride like a pro techniques, this is this is how you have to do it. And he caught on to it really quick. He was a, he was an excellent rider. I had him follow me through each exercise, and I told him you know, stay six inches from my rear fender and just watch me and, and take the exact path that I take through the course. And, you know, the translator translated that and he, he did very well with it. That's awesome. Very cool. Well, this is going to lead me into question number four. So during your ride, like a pro course, what, what do you think is the, the most common mistake that you see that the riders make during the course? Probably going too slow. Okay. Uh, you know, I, and I tell people anything below five miles an hour, there's more force of gravity pulling you to the ground than there is force pulling you forward. If you stay above five miles an hour and make sure that you keep power going to the rear wheel with the clutch and throttle, the bike won't fall over. And then there's the turning their head and eyes. And, and a lot of people, I'll watch them and I'll see them turn their head, you know, to the left, but their, their eyes are looking to the right. So it doesn't right. work. So that, that takes, uh, takes a lot of patience and uh, sometimes people get frustrated, you know, but I, I, I keep them, I keep at it with them. And I tell them, look, this is the day, this is what you're here for, for is to practice. If you were perfect, you wouldn't need me. I said, nobody here is perfect. So don't worry about dropping the bike. You, you know, you got crash guards on it and, and uh, you know, it, it works out pretty well. Most, most of my riders improve 200%. A bad, a bad day is when I can only double their skills. Right. Yeah. And I mean, the, at, at, they're, they're kind of being vulnerable too. you know, going to a course just to get their skills better. Because when we all start, we all start from scratch. And I know I've dropped my bike countless times, but it's while I'm practicing and not out on the road. Yeah. Well, the place you want to, if you're going to drop your bike, it's best to do it under control conditions and, and not out yeah. on the street. And I, I tell that to people, uh, you know, we use the clutch, the throttle, and, and a little bit of pressure on the rear brake. And and I tell people, when, the better you get, you you can eliminate when practicing, eliminate that rear brake because that'll make you better at clutch and throttle. I said, but out on the street, if you're going to make a U-turn, always use the rear brake because it's a little bit of a helper. And it, the last place you want to drop the bike is making a U-turn on the street and the car behind you runs you right over. So, you know, in the course empty parking lot with just rubber cones yeah you drop the bike big deal pick it up and, and keep going and i think you know about motorcycle drop guards are you familiar with oh, yeah. those oh yeah. yeah i'm a huge fan yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, it's the best invention that anybody's had in years because you could drop it all day long and nothing happens to buy no part of the bike actually touches the ground right yeah and i i actually had at one point those uh i found somebody in a Facebook group that makes like little metal collars. You've probably seen them before. Yeah. It's like little round collars. I use those for the longest time that work good, but I, I really like those motorcycle drop guards a lot better. Yeah. The one, especially the one that goes under the primary, cause on, I think yes. it's 14, 14 and newer bikes. If the bike falls on, if it falls hard on the left side, it's going to hit the primary. And if yep. you hit the primary, it's just aluminum. You could bend it. It's going to start leaking oil and it's going to cost five, 600 bucks to replace that. So with the, with the drop cards, you know, you don't have to worry about that. You could, I mean, we've, we dropped it. The, the, the owner came out to me. In fact, he was in my last ride, like a pro experience video. And, and I had him drop the bike at 20 miles an hour, slide it across the ground just so we could show that 
nothing happens. No part of the bike actually touches the ground. And, and it's uh, it's really takes that fear away from most people of dropping the bike and damaging it. So, you know, as long as you got crash guards front and rear and, and the, the motorcycle drop guards on, yeah, you could, you could it's three eighths inch steel. So you're not going to wear through it. Yeah. And it works yeah. really well. I, I think that's one of the, the biggest uh, like mind games with somebody trying that wants to practice, but, but won't is they're afraid to drop the bike, damage their bike, but we're spending all this money on upgrades, you know, getting better bars and exhaust when you could spend 300 bucks on some drop guards and actually invest in yourself. So that way you don't yeah. drop it. Yeah. I believe in adding things to the bike, anything you want, but if it makes the, if it doesn't make the bike run any better, you know, first get the, the stuff that you really need. And right. I always tell people, crash guards are the first thing you need. And then uh, if you got rear crash guards, get the, or an Indian or a Harley Davidson, get the motorcycle drop guards. And, and that, that should take all well, that fear of dropping the bike away. Yep, exactly. So uh, Guns and Roses, or Guns and Roses, Guns and Rides says, Hi, Jerry, been a big fan of yours. Bought your videos, watched all your videos. I really didn't get a, get good at it till I bought the motorcycle drop guards. See, exactly what we were just talking about. Yeah. Yeah, it gives you the confidence that, you know, if I drop it, no big deal. Nothing's going to happen. And uh, why not? You know, I would have 300 something dollars. It's the best investment you could make right. on your, your Harley or Indian. Yep. Uh, G Pops and Gigi says Joe asked Jerry about his singing career. <laughs> yes. Uh, who, how did they know about that? So G Pops and Gigi, um, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with them. Uh, they've they've attended multiple courses of yours so you oh. must have said something about it i don't know yeah, yeah it's possible <laughs> yeah when I, when i came to florida back in 77 i was in construction and boy it's hot down here mm -hmm. and, and uh, I, I knew I, I was always a, a pretty good singer so i saw an ad in the paper for a band that wanted a, a front man and a singer and uh i went over and auditioned and uh they immediately gave me the job and uh <laughs> We, we started with, I had a seven piece band. We went up to 14 pieces at one time, but the only problem with that is by the time you split the money, you, you, you couldn't make right. a living. With it. So I, I went down to a trio and then a duo. I had a great piano player and, and he had, a, he had needed a back operation. So we were working at a job at a, this country club. And he said, look, uh, I, I'm going to go in for this operation. I'm going to be out of commission for two months. Uh, I'm going to teach you to play the guitar and the bass pedals. He said, yeah, you got a couple of weeks to learn it. <laughs> I said, okay. And, and, uh, I, w it was either do that or go back into construction, sweating my ass off. So I, I learned the guitar and the bass pedals at the same time. And, and that gave me a career for God, 11 or 12 years. I worked a single act. It was the best way to make money in that business. because You, you didn't have to worry about the people not showing up for the rehearsals and, and you could sing and do whatever you wanted. There was no fighting. I was the only guy. And and uh, <laughs> back when I started back then, the bars were going like seven nights a week. Every every night was like Friday night. And and you could work as much as you want, especially as a single act. And, and I would work five, six days a week. I would do a happy hour. Uh, then I would go to bottle clubs. Because when the bars closed down here at one at one one or one thirty, you could then work till four o'clock in the morning at the bottle club. So you make serious money. There was no benefits then, no social security, but uh, lots of women. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> for a long time, it was a great way to make a living. Then I got married and I had to get a real job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we got Karen McRae that came in. She, she's the one that uh, she's really been waiting for this live stream. Cause as soon as I posted that you were coming on, she's, she said, it's about damn time that you brought them on. <laughs> she said, well, for the, if, if you would have doubled the salary you paid me for this, I would have come on yeah. sooner. <laughs> yeah. Garen says, ride like a pro in Miami is where I learned, yes, turn your head. Yes, that's uh, Marianne and Tim Hamilton uh, down there in, in Miami who do run that class. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I was making, I think it was ride like a pro four. And at the time, I, my wife, I wanted to get as many women in the video as possible. I had been training my wife, but uh, 24 foot turns was about the, the best she would do. And now she has a bad hip on one side. So I understood that. 
And I couldn't, you know, use any kind of negative motivation with her uh, because she would get mad and then she wouldn't want to practice. So we were making Ride Like a Pro for it. Marianne Hamilton and Tim Hamilton came up to where we were doing it at. We were, we were filming. And I had never met them before, but somebody told me their motor officer trained. And I said, OK, great. So they get there. And I happened to have the motor officer course set up because we, we show both in the video. And this little girl, Mary Ann, she's about the same size as my wife, five foot two, maybe 110 pounds. She's on a, a, a CVO uh, Road King or Electric Light. I'm not sure. But anyway, I said to her, you know, uh, this is the, the keyhole, which is an 18 foot circle with a five foot entrance. I said, you've done this before. She said, yeah. I said, can you do the keyhole? She said, I think so. And she pulled in there and she makes it to the left. And I said, great. Can you do it to the right? And she makes it to the right. So I said, ah. I got this. Now I'm going to demonstrate every exercise and then I'm going to have this girl, Mary Ann, to, to demonstrate it. And then the rest of the riders that were in the video. So it worked out really well. And now it comes time to make the cover for the video. So a friend of mine is sending me on the computer the different ideas that he had for the for the cover. And one of them was with me. I'm, I got the bike uh, on the floorboards going to the left and Mary Ann is right behind me on this yellow screaming eagle and she's got it on the floorboards to the right. I said, that's that's the cover I want. So now my wife is standing behind me, but she's not she's not saying anything. And uh, we start getting the videos and my wife and along with a couple other people at the time would, would package the video every time we sold them. We were selling 70, 80 videos a day. So 70, 80 times a day, my wife has to look at this girl, Marianne, on the cover and not her. Now, now I did put my, my wife on the back cover, you know, just her face along with the other writers in the video. So about two weeks of this, and I never said a word to her about this. About two weeks later, after stuff and all these videos and watching Marianne on the cover, she said, let's go out and practice. And she would never say that. So I said, okay. So we go out and practice, and I, I set up 24 foot. She said, no, I'll make it 22 feet. So, okay, so she does a U-turn in 22 feet. Uh, eventually, in, in about an hour, I get her down to less than 18 feet. So from that point on, which what had happened was she saw this other girl who's virtually the same size as her on the same bike do it and so she then figured in her head well if she could do it i could do it and she could and right. uh, three years later when we we did the next video my wife was on the cover behind me mary ann and tim were behind behind us so i call that negative motivation because i didn't tell her i didn't tell her that i'm putting the, this girl on the cover just to, to motivate you i never said that but she, it certainly motivated her. So that the, <laughs> the next video, she could make it on the cover. And, and uh, she got mad at that after a while when I said, yeah, that was my thought, you know, was to motivate you. But she got over it and she said, well, you did the right thing because it did motivate to me to be a, a great writer. So uh, sometimes, you know, neg there's negative motivation and there's positive motivation. Both of them work, but negative motivation works a little bit sooner. Ask anybody who's in the Marines. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'm in the army, so I, I well, so exactly you know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, there's plenty of negative motivation in boot camp, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, are you the one that got your wife into riding? Yeah. It, okay. It, uh, it was just before I went to uh, to motor school. I think that was what '97 or '98. I bought a uh, Honda 750 Shadow Ace because it looked like the Harley. But at that time, if you wanted to buy a Harley, you had to wait six months to get it. And it was five grand over MSRP. And I, I'm not going to pay a five grand over, over MSRP. So I bought a bike. And then a few months later, when she was riding on the back with me. And then I, I got her a 600 Honda. And then she, little by little, graduated up into uh, her own uh, full-size touring bike. And back in, I think it was 2004, Harley came out with a deal that if you're a motor officer or a fireman, you could buy it what they call the peace officer edition. And it was $2,000 under MSRP for this, the same bike as you would get as a civilian. And I went to my local dealer and the manager there said, no, no, he said, that's wrong. It's 2000 over MSRP because at that time they were selling all the bikes at over MSRP. And I said, no, nah, I think it's 2000 under. He said, no, that couldn't be. So I, I got on the internet. I found one of those road king up in uh, the panhandle. And I called the guy and I said, uh, you know, I've got my ID, my police ID and everything. He says, uh, well, yes, it's 2000 under MSRP. We don't add anything to it. I gave him a deposit over the phone and uh, I went up and, and picked it up the next day. And that was the, the first Harley that I bought. I, we, I had, uh, of course, my, my duty bike was a Harley, but uh, that was the first one that I owned. And I only the reason I bought it was because I wasn't going to pay MSRP. So 2000 below was a really good deal. OK, very cool. 
So we're going to hop into question number five, and then I'm going to get you guys a little more info on that break free. So for question number five, why, why do you think so many riders neglect training? Either they don't seek out a course, they just go through the test or maybe, maybe do the basic rider course and then that's it. And they think they know everything. Well, I don't know, you, you know, every state is different, but here in Florida, for it's been about 10 years now, you have to take the MSF course, regardless of your age. It used to be if you only if you were under 21, but now everybody has to take that if you want a motorcycle endorsement. And, and if you don't, if you ride a motorcycle without the endorsement, it's a criminal offense. So they could confiscate your bike and, and uh, you're going to wind up going to court. So I think that the MSF course is a very good beginner course, but at two and a half days, they just bore the crap out of you with so much stuff, throw so much information at it, that when people finish that and get their their license, they don't want to have anything. They think every everything else, all the other training is going to be just like that, bored to death. And, and uh, that prevents a lot of people from, from seeking uh, – more training than what you get in the MSF beginner course. Uh, a lot of people also don't realize that, especially when riding a motorcycle, it's not something that you you learn and then that's it. You're trained, you're good to go. But the best riders in the world, uh, look, look at Kyle Wyman, who just won the King of the Baggers race in, in Daytona. He trains all the time. If you want to stay at the top of your game to win races, you better be training every day. Uh, the competition is fierce. Uh, by the same token, even if you're not racing, if you're out on the street, that's the most dangerous place to be. You have to be, have as much training as possible. The training should never stop. The learning should never stop. You should always be out there. I tell people, once you get the techniques down, you pass the go through a course like I have, the Ride Like a Pro course, that's the beginning. If you stop training after that, you'll revert right back to where you were the morning you came to the class. But if you continue training even 15 minutes to 30 minutes a week, you just keep getting better and better. And, uh, you know, hopefully people take that to heart. Uh, my course is all about avoiding obstacles. The obstacles happen to be rubber cones in a parking lot. If you can't avoid a rubber cone in an empty parking lot, how, how do you think you're going to do when that car turns left in front of you at 40 miles an hour? Right. But, yeah. And I don't, I don't think people realize that it's, it's actually uh, at least uh, unless I'm some type of crazy, I think it's fun training. That's why I'm taking all these, different courses and stuff because i know i know that i'm never done learning while i'm riding a motorcycle it's one of the most dangerous things you can do so you have to invest in yourself and, and train yeah absolutely you know i tell people all the time most riders people ride 20 30 years what have you been doing for that time okay yep. you've been cruising down the road you make great big wide turns once in a while and you come to a nice easy stop you should have that the first week of riding. You should be able to do that. The problem is when something gets in your way, if you got a lean turn and swerve quickly and you've never practiced it, the time to practice that is not when that car turns left in front of you. Then it's too late. So, right. you know, get out there, practice as much as possible, learn as much as you can. And and it, I tell people, if you've never taken any training, you think motorcycle is fun. Imagine if you actually knew what the hell you were doing, how much more yeah. fun it's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great point. Uh, that I'm actually going to be taking that Yamaha champ school, uh, the street course. Uh -huh. I think that's going to teach me some stuff while I'm out on the road doing some twisty roads and stuff, and it'll make it even more enjoyable for me. Yes. I, I took that course, I think it was two years ago. And then I took the, uh, the two day course and, uh, when you're out on the track, you know, and you're going 100 miles an hour and you're having to brake hard for that turn, it's a, a, a great learning experience. And it's always taught by the best of the best. I mean, my, my coach was uh, Kyle Weidman. It doesn't get much better than that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right, guys. So I'm going to roll in and give you guys some info on this brake free light. And then I'll roll this video and we'll be right back.
When you're riding on two wheels, there's one rule you can't ignore. If they can't see you, they can't avoid you. That's why we have to do everything we can to be more visible while we're out on the road. In this video, I'm going to unbox and review the Brake Free Smart Brake Light. Let's talk features for a second. This light is special because it's completely wireless. You don't need to use any apps or connect it via Bluetooth to use it. So how does it work? It has sensors in it so it knows when you're braking or slowing down. This is great because sometimes we use engine braking to slow down. That means we're not using our brakes so our taillights aren't going on. This will give the motorists behind you a heads up that you're slowing down. It has a rechargeable battery that's supposed to last 8 to 12 hours depending on which mode you have it in. This light is IP65 waterproof and weighs in at 7 ounces, so it's really light. For the light itself, it has 100 LEDs and it's a single one button operation, so they keep it simple. We have the light all mounted to the helmet, now we have to test it. Let's roll, baby! Okay guys, we are on the bike. Let's test this bad boy out. Downshifting should illuminate it. Alright, now I'm slowing down with the brakes making a left okay so now we're coming up to the stop sign we're gonna do a hard stop should have blinked all right now we're gonna do some head movements to see if this thing's gonna blink or not they claim that it won't so we'll move my head up and down side to side and stuff all right now I'm rolling off the throttle all right guys, that was the ride test. As you just saw, this light works exactly as advertised. So what do I think about it? This is a fantastic product. Not only does it look cool, but it adds an extra layer of safety. You have it, brake free. If you, if you want one, I highly suggest it. It's one of the best products I've ever used and I don't typically promote any product, I only promote products that I use and I have a promo code and a link in the description. If you use promo code Jogo, you'll get $10 off your brake free light. So make sure you go ahead and use that and I guarantee you, you'll love it. All right. Well, yes, I recommend that as well. I've seen, I've seen it on Doodle and, and uh, she's come to a couple of my classes. Anybody out there who knows Doodle on a motorcycle, she's just a, yeah. uh, She's just as nice and sweet a person in, in person as you see on the video. She's just a wonderful girl. Yeah, she's awesome. I just had her on I, like three, four months ago. I had her on the podcast. She's, she's awesome. It was nice to finally meet her at, at your course. Yes. Okay. So let's move into question six. So what, what do you, what's your best advice for somebody that's practicing alone? Because sometimes, you know, it can kind of get boring just practicing by yourself. But do you have any tips or anything that just kind of liven it up a little bit? Well, the, the main thing is to, if you're going to practice on your own, there's nobody else around, make sure you know how to pick up the motorcycle. And right. you want to practice that in your garage at home or when there's somebody else around. Because if you drop your bike and you can't pick it up, well, that's the that's the end of the practice session. And now what are you going to do? Call somebody, come over there. You know, it's embarrassing. So that would be the, the first thing. But I, I would say to uh, you know, try to split it up. For instance, one of the exercises, we, we start with the slow cone weave. So we start with the cones at 15 feet apart and get them down at 12 feet. Well, you can also, in addition to weaving through all the cones in a straight line, you could turn circles around each of the cones, first to the left, then to the right. I mean, it's just a million things that you could do so so that, you know, once you, you get it the, the way you're supposed to do it, like a slow cone weave, weave through the cones, well, then think about what else you can add to that to challenge yourself. Right. And uh, for people that don't have cones, just use the lines in the parking lot. But I do suggest picking up some cheap cones, some of those disc ones. Those work pretty well. They fit well in your saddlebag, and you can set up all sorts of stuff if you want yeah they're cheap you know you i don't know what they are you know you could buy them uh, like 24 of them for what ten dollars or twelve dollars at walmart yeah. those soccer cones and always keep them with you and you know you're cruising along and you see a, a nice clean parking lot 
uh, and it's you know the business is closed. Pull in there, throw some cones down. The in, in most places in America, unless it says for compact cars, the the parking spaces are going to be nine feet apart. So right. two of them is eighteen feet, and you can judge from there. You can make use three parking spaces is twenty seven feet. You could practice your U turns in that, the circles, uh, figure eights, wh- whatever you want, and and uh, you really don't even need to set up cones for for something like that. So just got to use your imagination, but always make sure that you're pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone because you don't want to get into what I call a, a, a slow speed rut where, you know, if, if you're doing a, uh, well, let's say uh, like the offset cone weave, you know, and you can do that with the parking spaces and you're always at uh, five or six miles an hour. Okay. Let's, let's see if you can do the same thing at 10 miles an hour. Try to get those floorboards or pegs on the ground every time you, you make the turn. So you're always challenging yourself to push you beyond that comfort zone. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So I think it was last year or maybe the end of the year prior, like I got really good at my 18 foot U-turns. So the following year, last year, all summer, I worked on that darn keyhole at 18 feet and it uh-huh. took me all summer to finally get that darn keyhole. So now I got to move on to something else challenging. <laughs> well, you can narrow it down to uh, 17 feet. Yeah, well, it took me a long time to get that 18. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that was one of the most difficult exercises because when I went to motor school, we first did the uh, 18 by 36 figure eight, and then mm. they taught us the the uh, 18 foot keyhole. And I wish they would have done it the the opposite way because it's just a little bit different technique it takes uh, to to do that. And and I'll tell you a story about that. My my wife got she was able to do 18 foot turns. So we're at bike week and we we just had completed seven or eight shows uh, in the big parking lot there and this couple walked up and they have the everything is separated there with those bicycle fences and and the guy says my wife here is just learning to ride can your wife show her how to do a u-turn so i said sure so i, I yell over to her honey let's show him how to do the u-turn thinking she was going to do the u-turn where we had just done eight or ten shows instead she comes over to where i'm standing and there's a bicycle fence one one here and one over here and I don't know how the distance I'm looking at it, but I know it's pretty tight. And she makes the turn there. And she, it was so tight that her front tire hit the, the, the base of the bicycle fence. Mm. So she decides to do it again. So she does it again. Well, uh, the, the people said, okay, yeah, that looks great. And they walk away. And my wife is like standing there. And she's proud of herself. I said, what the hell are you doing? Why would you do the U-turn here between these two fences? You don't know how far it is. She said, well, I thought that's what you meant. So I got out a tape measure and I measured it. It was 17 foot, two inches between two barriers. And she oh. had no problem doing it. So I said, you know, it's mind over matter because she thought that uh, I meant to do it there, that she should be able to do it at that spot. Personally, I wouldn't have done it there because I didn't know what that distance was. I could estimate it pretty good, but I'm thinking, yeah, it's maybe 18, 19 feet. Well, it's actually 17 foot, two inches, and she still was able to do it. If I told her right now to make a 17 foot, two inch U-turn, she would have to do it four or five times. But because she she had it in her head that, well, I'm you know it's safe for her to do it because I'm telling her to do it there. So it's right. it's like a, it's, no, riding well is or skillfully is 90% mental, 10% physical. Yeah, that's another reason why I kind of encourage getting some cones because then you have an actual physical barrier and you can, just like you're driving a car, you eventually realize what you can fit through, what you can do with the car. And the same thing bleeds over to the motorcycle. Right. All right. Now let's move into question number seven. We touched on this a tiny bit, but. Do you think the MSF course needs to be relooked at and updated for today's standards? Um, you know, it's hard to say. If you make it too difficult for people, they're just going to ride without their license. You know, if they go through it, it used to be here in Florida, you could take a, a road, a little road test. And if you passed that that test, it was in a parking lot, you, you, you would get your license. But the measurements and the test was set up Back in the 60s, when a big bike was, you know, maybe a 60-inch wheelbase, a Triumph 750 or a Honda 750 was a big bike back then. So they had a 95% failure rate here in Florida for that test for anybody on a full-size motorcycle. So 
that now the, that test is gone. Everybody's got to take the, the MSF course. And it's, it's a good course to give you beginner skills. And at the end of those courses, they always say, okay, don't think that you're ready to go out and ride in traffic now. What you need to do is practice what you learned here. And therein, therein lies the problem. Most people, because like I said, they were so bored or so lucky or happy to get their license that they never practice again. And these are perishable skills. So a, a month after going through the MSF course, you forgot everything they taught you and you've never practiced. So you revert right back to being just a rider who depends on dumb luck rather than skill. So should they change it? I don't think so. And I'm against, uh, you know, making more and more laws. Ideally, right. ideally it would be, well, okay, you passed it now. Now a year later, you got to come back on your whatever motorcycle you're riding and take that course again. And then a year after that, you need to take an even more advanced course. But I, I just don't feel it's right for the government to force people to do that. We've got enough laws on the books now already. Uh, if you don't, if you never practice and you never train, yeah, you're you're probably a crash looking for a place to happen. Yeah. So yeah. people just need to take riding the motorcycle much more seriously than most people do. Uh, you know, just cruising from bar to bar with uh, with your friends on Sunday doesn't make you a skilled rider. Yeah, and that that can get pretty like some people that actually go to take the course and they go in all confident, saying, you know, I've been riding for. 30 years, they, they get humbled really quick once they go to one of those courses. Yes, I, I've had people come to my class who whose skills are so lacking that uh, I have to stop them. After an hour, I say, look, you're, you're going to get hurt if you keep going, because uh, if you can't make it through the first exercise, it's going to get harder as we go along. So your best bet is go back, take the beginner course on a small bike, uh, then practice with what they taught you. Maybe get yourself a cheap uh, little 250 Honda and practice everything on it. Come to the class, my class again, with the 250 Honda or some small bike, but, because they're always coming to my class with, you know, a, a, an Ultra or yeah. a Goldwing or, you know, a bike like that, and they really have no business being on it. Sure, they could cruise down the road, but that doesn't take any skill. It's the accident avoidance where, where everybody needs help. And, and the most common motorcycle crash that involves just a rider is failure to negotiate a curve. So here in Florida, okay, we don't have a lot of curves, but uh, what curves we do have, people are still running off those curves just because they don't know where to look. They, they look at the guardrail or the oncoming car and they crash all the time. So to prevent that, you need to take uh, as, as much, get as much training as you possibly can. It should never stop. You should always be learning when riding a motorcycle. Yeah, I I know in some other countries they they have some pretty strict laws. Like you have to ride for a certain amount of time, take all these courses before they even give you your license. Yes, here's the funny thing about that. I've had a lot of riders come from the UK who you got to jump through a bunch of hoops to get your license mm -hmm. there, and it cost you a couple thousand dollars. So it's it's the same thing there. After they get and by the way, they could take their full license test on a six six fifty cc bike. I don't know why they go by CCs, but you can, <laughs> there's plenty of 650 CC bikes that weigh 350 pounds or 400 pounds. And then they go out and they buy a 900 pound motorcycle. So th these people come here and they'll rent a Harley or an Indian or a Goldwing or whatever. And they come to my class and their skills are just as lacking as Americans. So oh, wow. I, I don't think, I don't think that really helps. It, it's, it's a very rare time when I get a European rider comes here and, and they, they're, I would call, you know, even half, half as skilled. They're, they're yeah. the same as American riders. They don't, they, they finished all that stuff, jumped through all the hoops, bought the 800 pound bike, and then never practiced what they learned while jumping through all those hoops. So they revert right back to where they were at the very beginning. Yeah, that that's crazy. I, I figured that they would be a little better, but obviously you've had experience with them and it's, Yes, I, I was fr at first amazed by it because I know what they have to go through to, to get a license there. And and then they come to my class and they're just like everybody else. They don't know what the hell they're doing. So so uh, I say, how could this be? So that's the only thing I could think of is once they got that full license, they just stopped all their training. They never practiced again. And if you put them back on a 650 bike, they probably suck just as bad as they do on the 800 cc bike because they haven't done any of that stuff in years. Yeah. And they're just, again, cruising down the road, hoping for the best. Right. All right. So we're going to move into question number eight. And I have another video. Uh, and I know for some reason you're not getting audio on 
your end when I play these videos, but we're just going to have to roll with it. But so I'm going to play this video and then we'll come back with the question. Okay. I came out to train with a few of my friends. You might know a couple of them. Hey, Jerry Motorman Palladino here from Ride Like a Pro. Hi, I'm Meg from Meg's Motorcycle Journey. I'm Carolyn from Doodle on a Motorcycle. I'm Andy, MCC Just Motos. And this is what I'm going to be riding. After the slow ride, we moved into the cone weave that fed into a U-turn. All of us got through this pretty easily as well. Not too shabby for a bunch of YouTubers, eh? Now we moved into the offset cone weave. This is where I really started to get the feel for this little sportster. Everyone else was able to breeze through this exercise as well. Gary saw this and decided to throw the first curveball at us. Okay, I know that this is not as much of a challenge as you're, you're usually used to, so I'm gonna make it a little tougher. I, I know that deep down in your soul, that's what you're saying. Can you make it a little harder? Okay, okay. No, so, nobody said that. Two bikes. Go ahead. Jerry teamed me up with Andy from MCC Just Motos. We were able to execute the exercise with finesse. Jerry again saw this wasn't much of a challenge, so he made three of us go in at the same time. Andy stuck with me and Doodle for a second, but that electric motorcycle couldn't handle it. No fault to Andy though, he's a great rider. Good riders, you know, who just are, are uh, just learning the skills. Yeah. All right, Jerry. So the question that went with that video, but were you impressed with the YouTubers that took your course last month? Uh, yes, and I expected it because I knew some of them. I'd seen some of your videos, so I knew you would have a problem. Doodle had trained with me a couple of times. Megan had trained with me, uh, I think, two times as well. Uh, I was a little surprised that, you know, that she never continued practicing, and you could see that in the video that she was having problems with, that she shouldn't have had had she just you know, kept practicing and, and uh, like Doodle does or, and, and uh, who else do we have? Oh, the, the other guy that was in the class, I didn't know him at all. So, so I, uh, you know, but he yeah. did very well considering he didn't have a clutch, you know, he's on the electric motor bike. So you just got uh, the throttle against the, the rear brake, but, but he did pretty good. Yeah. So, if, so yeah, overall it was much better than my average class. My average yeah, that, class, like I said, to do those same things would have taken four to five hours. Yeah, it was definitely a good time. And I have a full video on my channel if you guys want to check it out. Jerry put one out. Uh, Meg's Motorcycle Adventure put one out. Wow. And I'd imagine Doodle's going to put one out eventually. She she takes a while to put out videos, but it's totally yeah. worth it. Yeah, Doodle is a stickler for, for with her editing. But she yeah. does put out a nice video. Her videos are like a like watching a sitcom because she's she's just a very funny person, and and she does a great job with the editing. In that you, you know you feel like you're watching a TV show. Right, right. I I, I don't think anybody can hate Doodle. I mean, <laughs> she doesn't give any reasons. It's awesome. Okay, so now we'll move into question number nine. So. Obviously, you were a motor officer. So, what was your most memorable experience while you were a, a motor officer? Uh, I, I would say doing an escort for for the president. Uh, oh, wow. and we did one. We did one for uh, George Bush, and uh, I think McCain. And, and uh, when you're doing that type of escort, you're the, the the plan is you have to make sure the roads are blocked off uh, because you're accelerating from the motor, the, the motorcade is moving at probably 60 miles an hour. So you have to accelerate top speed 100, 105 on city streets, hoping to God that the, the, the next street is blocked off and that there's an officer there and nobody's trying to get around them. And then you have to get up ahead of the motorcade and then you're blocking streets as you, until the motorcade passes. And then again, you gotta get back on the bike, accelerate past them and, and block off streets up ahead. So that was a puckering experience. And, and a dangerous one because, it, believe it or not, people will go around the police car or the motorcycle that's blocking the side street. Uh, they'll pay no attention to you, so you never know what's going to pull out in front of you. And uh, that's probably the, the the most dangerous thing that we that we ever do. Um, we've also done a lot of these uh, 9/11 rides or toy runs, and in every one of those, we always give instructions before. But when you've got, a, you know, 100, 150 people, you have no idea what their skill level is. It's right. also 
a, a dangerous situation. And every one of those those type of things we did, there's always at least one crash and usually three or four on the way. And even though you're going slow, you know, you're going 20, 30 miles an hour, you have the streets blocked off, but somebody's always going to screw up. They're not looking ahead. And, you know, you get that accordion effect where the guy up front slowing down and then all of a sudden the guy 20 bikes back is uh, not paying attention and he smacks into the rider in front of him so so yeah I, now after those experiences i never ride with people whose skill level i'm not aware of yeah that, that's a good point I, I try to stay away from group rides as well because you don't know how these people ride and uh, in my experience i i always have somebody in a group ride that likes to come up and ride right next to me and i don't know the person and they don't know the proper etiquette. It's like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> yep. I avoid, avoid group rides like the plague. Yeah. Okay. So for my last question for you, and then I'll open it up for Q and a, my last question is what's the worst experience you've had riding a motorcycle? Uh, I, I once had somebody, I was stopped at a light waiting to make a left-hand turn. The car behind me stopped, so I'm not worried about him. And then just as I'm ready to go and make my turn, the guy behind me hits the gas and smashes into my bike. And not just smashed into it, but he kept pushing me completely off the road into a ditch. So it, it turned out the guy was like 85 years old. And, and his, he said his, his foot slipped off the, the gas or off the, off the brake onto the gas. And he was trying to stop, and uh, he said he was pushing as hard as he could on the brake. He was actually pushing up the gas pedal. So, oh yeah, that, that was about the worst experience. Uh, I dislocated his shoulder, went into the ditch. You know, the bike is, like, completely upside down, almost on top of me. Uh, but I did have Affleck. So I knew, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, Affleck, is, I think it was at the time, uh, if, you, if you got into an ambulance and went to the hospital, they would give you 500 cash. If you took a helicopter, they would give you a thousand dollars. So yeah. as it as as it happened, wh when the crash occurred, there there was a, an ambulance just at the light. So th the guys walked over to me, and you know I got up. I was able to get up, and I could feel my problem with my shoulder. And I said, I think uh, I, I called the helicopters. So they go, guys, <laughs> you don't need the helicopter. We're going to take you to the hospital. It's only a mile away. I says, I, I really would like the helicopter. I got Affleck. You know they pay you a thousand bucks. Take this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I get I get in the ambulance and about three or four months before this incident occurred, I pull over a fireman and uh, he was speeding and he shows me his badge. So whenever they would do that, I would I would put on my southern accent. I say, oh, so you got that there badge. You're a fireman. So so you run over some little kid. You just show his mama that that badge and she say, OK, never mind. So the guy and, and as he's handing me his license, his hand is shaking. And I said, Dad, I'm just messing with you. So he got a little bitch. So I'm in, I'm in the ambulance, and this guy goes to me, man, that, that leg looks bad. I think you're going to lose that leg. I said, no, it's my shoulder that's bothering me. But my pants were ripped at my knee. He goes, yeah, I think you're going to lose that leg. I said, What's, there's nothing wrong with my leg. Well, it turns out it was the guy whose balls I was breaking. Uh. It was a fire, fire pit EMT. <laughs> so he came back to haunt me. Well, that's funny. I wouldn't even know what to do in that situation. Somebody hits you in the back and then they just keep on pushing. It's like, right, right. It, it was their uh, mercy. They probably pushed me 30 or 40 feet into, and I'm trying to get off the bike, but I can't yeah. do it because the bike is leaning to the left and the car is between me and the, and the motorcycle. So I had no choice, but to get pushed along with the motorcycle into the drainage ditch on the side of the road. Luckily there was no water in the drainage ditch. Yeah. I, I had something similar happen to me, la I think it was last year or two years ago. I was sitting at a red light. Everybody was stopped, and this lady just thought the light was green, so she just smashed into the back of me. But luckily, she stopped, not like in your situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I thought the guy was trying to kill me. I said, yeah, it must be a cop hater. But no, he was just an old <laughs> guy who mistook the uh, gas for the brake. Yeah. All right, guys, so... I'm opening up the chat for Q and A. So if you have any questions for Jerry, feel free, drop them down in the comments. I do know we're kind of on a short delay. So the questions will come in here in just a second. In the meantime, I'll go through the chat, see if I see any questions. Mm, let's 
see. Lee Sturges said, please hit that like button. Yes, please. Definitely helps me out. Uh, let's see. And, and tell Sturges one of these days I'm going to go to her rally. Oh, okay. <laughs> Lee's actually a, a guy. <laughs> oh, okay. We'll tell him I'll go to his rally. <laughs> you never been to Sturges? No, I haven't been out there. It's it's uh we thought about it when I was doing the shows, but boy, that's like four days out there on a on a in a motor home and four days back. So that's eight days away from home without you know holding my class and such. So I said no, it's, it's really not worth it. So haven't been out there. Okay. Yeah, me neither. I, I would, I'd really like to go when it's not the, the bike week, you know, and do some nice riding out there because you know, when you're out there and there's there's you know thousands and thousands of people. Yeah, it's not that much fun to me. I've I've been to so many rallies. I know what the vendors have. I know I know everybody that's going to be there. So I would rather go when it's not the the Sturgis rally and just enjoy the ride. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually, Karen put a comment up not too long ago. She said, "I want to let you know that I was LMAO at myself all day for the question I asked about your screaming eagle helmet." Oh yeah, I I I I just happened to have a screaming eagle uh, sticker that I think it, it came from uh, an air filter I put on my bike, and I got a big scratch at the top of the helmet. I dropped the helmet, and it was scratched. So I just put that sticker over the uh, the scratch. So that helmet, I think, is a HJC helmet, but <laughs> it, it says screaming eagle on it. So I don't, you know, yeah. the, the, it's funny the things the things that people uh, see in my videos that I say. What the hell you're looking at? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's funny. All right, let's see here. Um, I know Lee Sturges asked. I can't find the comment, but he asked, "Is there a somewhere that he can find the dimensions for uh, the dimensions and exercises for the police motor officer course?" Uh, I'm sure that they're they're available online. Now, I have a practice guide. That anybody could download from ridelikeapro.com but that's that's based on it's the same exercises but they're based on 24 foot so if you wanted to get those exercises and narrow them down to 18 feet yeah that that will cover just about every of the, every one of the exercises in the motor officer course just narrow it down okay uh, let's see scroll down here it's getting dark out so i'm taking off my tinted glasses oh, okay oh, now i can see better <laughs> uh all right it doesn't look like there's really any more questions coming in so i'm gonna respect your time but before you go uh why don't you go ahead and let everybody know where they can find you and all that good stuff on the on the internet well, if, if if you go to my website, it's ridelikeapro.com, and uh, you see all my videos there. They're they're available as, like I said, DVD, download, or even on a USB. And uh, you know, we we even have a, a deal that constantly goes on shortcuts to riding like a pro and surviving the mean streets, just twenty bucks. But both of those videos, uh, that's for people who, uh, you know, maybe you go to a nice parking lot, you don't have any cones or anything with you, and, and the shortcuts video will will show you how to practice without using any cones or with a very minimal amount of cones. And also there's my Ride Like a Pro book. So if you're a reader, uh, it's that book has sold uh, somewhere around 50,000 copies over the years. And just about everything in that book still holds true. Uh, as far as my YouTube channel, it's the Ride Like a Pro channel. Like I said, I've got about 1,600 or more videos up on that channel, everything from mostly tips, tricks, and techniques to uh, products uh, that, that I, I use and, and, and endorse, and uh, also motorcycle road tests and reviews. So that's the Ride Like a Pro channel on YouTube, and I'm also on Instagram. Okay. So you can pretty much find me anywhere. All right, perfect. And I put the links down to Jerry's YouTube channel and his website in the description, so if you want to check that out, make sure you do. Jerry? I appreciate you coming on, man. It was a pleasure meeting you in Florida and it, good conversation. Couldn't ask for a better guest. Well, I, I, thanks for having me. And I know I could go on a bit because I, I've been at this so many years. I got a lot of stories <laughs> and uh, I enjoy talking motorcycles anytime with anyone, even you. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. Even me. <laughs> Even you. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Jerry. I appreciate you. All right. All right, guys. So that's going to wrap it up for the for the podcast. I want to thank everybody that tuned in, dropped your questions. And I also want to give a huge shout out to Break Free. Again, link in the description if you want to get one of those bad boys. Definitely, definitely get one. It's totally worth it. Use my promo code JOGO10. And one last shout out to all the Let's Go crew members, the members in my on my YouTube channel. Definitely appreciate you and all the subscribers. And if you guys want to check out any of my other prior live stream conversations, if you're watching this on the replay, I'll put a playlist right here. And as always, this is Joe Go with Joe Go Motorcycle Adventures. Until next time, ride on.